When Paola invited me to speak tonight, I thought, perfect, because as a museum educator, my job, frankly, is to build a sense of immersion and foster participation among visitors as they engage with art. And moreover, it just so happens that my favorite kind of art are works that are generally described as immersive and participatory. So I'm gonna share a few of the, those with you and also some quick musings that I hope will um, inform our discussion tonight. Educators and psychologists like to distinguish immersion um, two different kinds. The kind that's perceived largely through the five senses and for that very reason, appealing to our sensory perception motivates many artists like this one, the one who made this work, James Terrell, and you can experience it. It's called Meeting. Meeting is a squarish room with seating along the walls underneath a hole cut in the ceiling, completely open to the sky. On a clear day like this one, not today, you may not even realize that you're looking at the sky. It's such a beautiful, completely seamless blue but then a bird flies by. Over time, you slow down and notice small details like shifts in color on the walls, and you might even enter a meditative state. You feel connected to the earth and the universe at the same time. To fully experience meeting, you don't need to know that Terrell studied psychology be before becoming an artist or that he participated in groundbreaking museum effort known as the Art and Technology Program at the Los Angeles Museum of Art, or that in 1969 he collaborated with another artist, Robert Irwin, seated here. Here you see them sitting in an anechoic chamber, a chamber that deprives um, anyone inside it of any kind of sound at all. It sucks the sound right out of the space. After this groundbreaking collaboration, both artists continued to focus their work on sensory immersion. Here's Irwin's recreation of a Gans field. These sensory rich environments are seductive, they're universal, they're self-referential, they calm us down, and generally speaking, they make us happy. Um, another kind of immersion, you might have already guessed, begins with our intellect. And as much as sensory immersion is inclusive, everybody can appreciate the uh, sensory immersion. Cognitive immersion is exclusionary. Generally speaking, there's a narrative going on in these works, but the artists only give you a few hints, and sometimes it requires a lot of work to figure it out. Some artists even drop the images altogether and immerse visitors in walls of words that made no logical sense. Like in the works by Terrell and Irwin, it was up to the visitors to complete the artwork with their own experience, but unlike those works, it's hard to understand what's going on here. Unless you're a keen student of modern and postmodern ideas, you're fresh out of luck. So museum professionals hear a lot about participation in museums these days. It's usually framed in democratic language, embraces multiple voices and perspectives as a superior engagement strategy. Here the Tate decided not to assume it knew what the role of a museum audience should be. Instead, it used a post-it board to crowdsource the answer right in the center of the Tate's new performance art gallery space known as the Tank. Chances are these visitors will never know whether the Tate has taken action on their suggestions or frankly, whether the Tate even reads them. It's not a superior form of participation in my opinion. Um, something I like better, uh, this kind of participation I want to emphasize is the kind that evolves from a common instinct to learn. Parents, educators, psychologists know that when children can change the outcome of an event, even through their own effort, um, knowledge is gained. Navigating this narrow Nauman corridor, you encounter your image on display on the top, but an empty hallway on the bottom. Do you know there must be a surveillance camera somewhere? But why is the image only showing on one screen? Are you really there? This disorientation might make you feel lost or perhaps worried that Big Brother is watching you or maybe claustrophobic from the tight space or maybe triumphant because you've actually figured out the secret. All and every outcome is possible and the visitor completes the work. Enormous quantities of clean, multicolored skeins of wool from a textile mill fill the bottom of our PS1 lower level space. Into this mix of fabric elements, 
the artist has hidden many real gold necklaces for visitors to find. Participation behaviors are varied. Some visitors dig methodic, sorry, methodically to find the prize. Others bring a book to read and enjoy the soft supportive surface. Others chill in a group and practice braiding. Whether digging, jumping, or resting, visitors are completing the work in their own personal way. An important quality, I think, for a successful participatory experience, and by the way, a great sensory immersion experience as well. As Paula spoke in her notes, Museums are naturally immersive and participatory environments. And this is true whether the art on display has the qualities I just described or not. MoMA welcomes such a varied group of visitors who come from every background, culture, educational level, that it's hard, if not impossible, to create a perfect museum experience for every visitor. Here's an example. These two visitors were with me in the museum on a special tour for about an hour. Um, I asked my guests to fill out one of our I went to MoMA and cards, and their responses could not be more different. Elena on the left, who's had a lot of art training and interest, was energized by all the art that she saw everywhere. Her cousin Andrew, on the other hand, wasn't getting the cognitive sensory perception. <laughs> he felt overwhelmed. There was too much information for him. He didn't have the kind of um, narrative, the personal narrative he needed to, to get him as excited as Elena was. I just want to now talk a little bit more about how education figures into this sort of puzzle. Here are kids that just finished a surrealist game in the galleries. They, they played exquisite core which is, in fact, like kind of what it looks like. Each of them drew a part of the body without showing the other which part they drew. And then when they unfold it, there's a monster that um, is pretty cute that reveals at the end. We pay a lot of attention to the ways that people like to learn and can learn. We encourage group participation. This is a reenactment of a Yoko Ono performance um, to, in conjunction with the exhibition of Tokyo Modern Art. We try to support individual um, explorations uh, in the galleries, as well as group informal learning. I think that we have to keep in mind that we want to preserve the immersive quality um, that, that art brings to the table and whatever cognitive immersion the visitors are bringing to the table. So the technology piece has to be um, very carefully managed. And I'm out of time, so I'm going to stop there. <laughs>